Okay, folks, we are back, and yeah, uh, so we're having like a little glitch here and there. We're gonna just, you know, say that uh, that, that uh, things happen. We'll just we'll just say that we'll be okay with it. Um, so let me go ahead and move over uh, this chat so that we can have this conversation. I've been very much looking forward to. There you are. We're on screen. Okay, in a real haphazard way. Ashley, welcome to the program. Yes. Yeah, yeah. How are you doing today? Yeah. Yeah, got gotcha. Um, and it is central time where you're at, right? Awesome. How is your position going? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, and before you, you even, uh, I mean, like, before you started this position, had you taught a class on food rhetorics? Yeah. Um, but I had not taught food rhetorics, and it was, you know, like after I signed the contract, the department chair was like, "Hey." do you want to teach a graduate level food rhetorics course? And I was like, yes. <laughs> yes. Amazing. It's like living the dream. You get to like teach exactly what you researched and, and things, all, all that good stuff. Yeah. And it, it's the first time this semester is the first time that uh, several rhetoric courses have been offered in a while. Mm. We just haven't had the bandwidth to offer it. Um, and so I think the grad students are really enjoying it. Some of them are taking both rhetoric classes. And so they're kind of seeing how, you know, my class also feeds into the other rhetoric class, which is more environmental. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. And are you teaching any uh, food, food courses like uh, rhetoric and writing courses next, uh, next term? Nope. Next semester, I'm going to teach uh, technical communication. Okay. And it's an, it'll be an online course. And uh, our big project though, is going to be a social media campaign and uh we're gonna talk about monsters okay and so we're gonna think about monsters in pop culture and they don't have to choose that topic but that's how we're gonna get started fantastic ah oh, wow yeah. well congrats again starting the like, first term you know and getting actually to be on campus and all that sort of stuff and um yeah amazing but let's start with something that i was talking to you about a little earlier like uh, boy, we were preparing for the interview. Um, I would ask, like, what did you have for breakfast today? I'll tell you <laughs> in a minute what mine was. But yeah, uh, so I call this like, you know, professor on the go. <laughs> so <laughs> I have to have something, especially because I study food. But I'm like a morning researcher, so I was like, I have to have things that I can uh, just bring with me. So I had a protein shake, which is not super exciting. Um, but it was pumpkin spice. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's oat milk, vegan protein powder. And then I threw in some vegan yogurt and a pumpkin spice blend from Bloom. So it's all natural ingredients. So that's what kept me going this morning. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Mine was, uh, what was it? Siggy's yogurt. With granola, I find that's just like enough to get me, get me going. Like yeah, for a I need, hours. I need something to hold me over until like twelve thirty one. Yeah, when I I'm like yeah okay, I can have lunch now. Yeah, um, what's your teaching schedule? Because I I have it's I swear it's related to food, but I just wanted to <laughs> ask you. About that. Uh, so I'm teaching my grad class is from five thirty to eight p.m. on Thursdays. Oh okay, wow. Yeah, so. <laughs> I bring a lot of baked goods to class because, okay. you know, we need food at 5.30. Uh, and then my undergrad class is online. So that's, you know, but then I'm, I like to, you know, I get up and I, I do my research and then mm -hmm. I have writing center time and office hours. So that fills up my day. Mm -hmm. um, I was asking because both of my classes I teach right now are 11.30 to 2.30. Hey, I have the same mug, by the way. 
Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yes. I wonder why. Right. <laughs> I didn't mention that too. Yes, I will mention that in just a minute. But um, yeah, it's like 1130 to 230. So I'm in this awkward space where I'm like, okay, I can eat really early in the morning or I can eat something light. And then right before I teach, I can eat because I, I don't really eat when I'm teaching. I'm just kind of, I don't know. I guess I'm just so like quenched by my nervous energy. <laughs> like, it's just, I forget, oh, it's 2.30, I'm, I'm done, you know, but I feel, yeah. I really wish, I don't know, I like that schedule, but it's it's tough. Like, I just tell people to bring food and I should probably bring more goods like you're doing. Well, I think, you know, in food rhetorics, I feel like sometimes we have to have food, you know. Yeah. I think my, my favorite day was um, I brought in my sourdough bread and my sourdough bread starter and had them do a multi-sensory eating experience. Mm, wow. <laughs> yeah. So I walked them through eating it and then we wrote about it. Uh, that was the most fun. Yeah. You, you mentioned food rhetoric. So I want to just ask you um, about that term and so forth. Like, how do you explain that term to students and you know, any interested parties? I know recently you were on the job market, you know, and you have to explain this stuff over and over. So tell us, like, how would you, how would you define it? So it's kind of, twofold is grounded in constitutive rhetoric for me. So I kick it back to Maurice Charland and thinking about how, you know, rhetoric is identity formation. Mm. And so when I'm talking to rhetoric people, that's generally, you know, I say it's constitutive rhetoric um, and how, you know, we have to find some common ground and food can be that common ground to persuade people. When I'm talking to non-rhetoric people, I talk about food ways and you know, I talk about this with rhetoric folks as well, but uh, foodways is just that cultural, social, and political qualities of food, mm -hmm. and it's it's the way that you know a lot of pop culture talks about food, and the Southern Foodways Alliance. Um, really, they they're all about foodways mm -hmm. in the South and mm -hmm. how you know, everything is, it has that cultural, social, and political element to it mm -hmm. whenever you're thinking about food. So that right there, I mean, shows how food is rhetorical mm -hmm. <laughs> without, without saying rhetoric. Yeah. I mean, that first, I love that. I mean, the first uh, thing that you were mentioning as like, a, it's, if I heard that right, like persuasive to draw people together. Like, I think I was trying to write this question to you the other night when I was thinking about what to ask you and I couldn't quite articulate it in a way that I thought was interesting. So I was like, I'll just talk about it here. But, um, it was about like the idea that people really hold, um, dinner as like a, a, a time, like, especially across like industries or like the dinner, if we're going to do the dinner. This is where we like either try to pick your brain or get to know you better or something like that. But like, at least I remember being on the job market. That was like a really powerful moment at every time. Like, that was my time to really, I don't know, uh, I guess persuade people like that I was maybe a worthy, that I would like to come to your department, right? And like, I just, it was amazing. Some places I went, it was just all about eating. Like they said, we <laughs> really take pride in this, like multiple dinners and multiple like lunch or breakfast. And I just remember being like really being kind of also nervous about that, like how I was eating, what I was doing and trying to also talk. I don't know. Because you sit there and it's, you know, it's not a formal interview, but the entire thing is an interview. Yeah. And yeah, when I came to Western, uh, I was really happy they didn't do breakfast. Mm. Not because I don't like breakfast, but uh, so I'm, I'm a pescatarian with a dairy allergy. Mm. And a lot of places put milk in their eggs. Mm. Okay. Or if there is uh, milk and bread and then, you know... I would be sick for the rest of the interview, which is like not ideal. Mm -hmm. So when I got to Western and, you know, I got my agenda, it was like they weren't going to do breakfast, which is great. But they gave me, you know, a goodie bag with like granola bars and fruit. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, you know, I'm set. Yeah. And then, you know, then there's lunch and uh, and dinner and stuff. But yeah, when I got here, I got here on like a Thursday afternoon, evening and then I went out to dinner that night and I did lunch and dinner the next night and then did lunch on my way out. So there's just so much food as part of this interview process. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely, yeah. And it's, it's deciding what's going to be best for conversations too, you know, or not make, I remember reading some stuff about that. Don't get like the messiest thing, get like the easiest thing. And but sometimes the thing you really want at the time is really, you know, not going to be as, I don't know, um, the optics might be a little different. I don't know. It, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a thing that I, I hope many people do not have to go through multiple times. <laughs> it's, like, it's a little challenging. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So we talked about some of that stuff, uh, that the term, I mean, lovely description there. I, I was wondering, um, you know, you mentioned with your students that you were having them uh, basically activate like the multi-sensory experience of sourdough. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, like, what are some strategies you recommend for writing about food? Because um, I was like at the top of the stream, I was reading some very cringe worthy sort of stuff from like 2011 that I was writing. And I always found it really difficult to put my tastings and impressions of food into words. When I was a reporter, it's just like I can describe it. But I, I don't know, just writing, putting it down on paper was always really challenging. Yeah, I think it is really hard to describe food because, you know, we all make these associations with certain foods. So when I introduce it to students, we talk about memory. And mm -hmm. so we focus on food memories in particular. And Meredith Abarca and Joshua Colby co-authored uh, an introduction to a special issue on food. And uh, they basically talk about how food memory is this kind of longing for home. So you get a little mm -hmm. bit of that nostalgia in there. Um, but they also emphasize that it's an embedded experience and mm -hmm. that it incorporates multiple modes. So that really stood out to me as a definition there because multimodal composing has always been part of, you know, what I do and believe in in the classroom. And so we start off having just kind of these multimodal, multi-sensory experiences. And, you know, I'll ask students to describe in detail where you were when you ate your favorite dish mm. or, uh, or even maybe like last night's dinner, you know, <laughs> depending on what the, the purpose of the class is. And so we start with location and then, um, depending on the length of the class, we move into the senses next to kind of have that embodiment. So they already do free writing around the location, where they are, who's there, and they're not eating anything at that point. Mm. And then I ask them <laughs> to, you know, go there and eat. And so the next week or whenever they'll go and have this eating experience and they focus on um, smell taste and touch first because those are the quote unquote lower senses hmm. and we want to emphasize that to have an embodied experience so rather than focusing on sight and sound which are privileged a lot of the time mm -hmm. we want to have that embodied eating and so i ask them to you know eat things with their eyes closed okay <laughs> and and just kind of we talk about mouthfeel so mm -hmm. there's a a short segment on NPR about mouthfeel mm. on uh, the Splendid Table that we'll listen to. And just thinking about, you know, where the food hits on your tongue, what flavors you notice, but also what memories it recalls. So we really ground it all in memory. Mm, and then the third, yeah, the third element of that is a cultural um, take where I ask them to think about the history and the politics of this food. So then they start going into you know, well, why are we eating uh, beef on weck in Buffalo? I grew up in Buffalo, so that's my, yeah. you know, Not shout out to us. the, yeah. yeah, shout out to the <laughs> the Buffalo food. Uh, excellent. I mean, the, the idea of uh, memory, because I think like, it, you, I, I remember seeing it a lot in, um, or doing that quite a bit. I was just pulling up an old review I had um, and trying to discreetly take notes as I was sort of, going to doing reviews and someone would say are you a reporter and i'd say oh, I, I don't uh, know you know <laughs> whatever else I, I am but you know it was it was it was hard to remember everything that i experienced and i remember for me at least 
it's, it was more interesting to kind of narrate the whole thing that was happening with this group of people and then describing like ingredients and stuff. But like, did students ever just say to you something like, um, what do I say beyond like, it tastes delicious? You know, that's just, it's so easy, right? Oh yeah, it was really great. But I just, to yeah. say something really original about my impression of it to, to convey or show that I loved it or something, it was really hard. Food reviews are really hard. Yeah. You know, because it's so, it's, everyone is going to have a different experience with it. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I think if they can capture the setting first and then think about the food, um, because a lot of the times, uh, if you go into a restaurant and you have like, when I, when I teach review writing, we talk about like when you go in and where, where you're seated, because if you're sitting, you know, mm. by the door and it's the middle of winter, you might write a worse review of this restaurant just because you're mm. cold. Yeah. And so it's really taking everything and doing, you know, a place-based kind of rhetorical analysis to understand that it's food is one component of this of this piece that you're writing it's the focus but we have to build to that hmm interesting i mean um okay i didn't i didn't i didn't plan this with you i apologize but i have to send this to you you just have i just would like just as a as a kind of uh what do you call it um tests right i just <laughs> like if you were giving feedback what would i don't know what would you uh what would you say i'll put this in the chat for you so we'll go there. But um, I remember it was, what was it? Uh, let me define this here. There was something we were talking about that the servers, I remember, were like really hasty. And like mm. as this morning I was thinking about this like that. Maybe that drove my impression. But there was also some other like ethics kind of at stake with the review itself. Like I remember the place I worked for, like didn't, didn't really like um, like super negative reviews because that would affect advertising right so i was like okay i'm gonna show that the server is kind of hasty in different ways but i think in this description like of describing like appetizers if you if you were you able to grab it yeah i've got it you see like it's sort of where i say still we enjoy the atmosphere as well as the fair and i go through like describing these i mean ingredients i've got that kind of stuff but like i talk about a sweet aftertaste there's not much like, does it really, I guess, convey like it, 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 it was interesting or it wasn't, I don't know. Um, so I, on the surface, what do you, what do you like, what would you suggest if you were to look at this? I'm, I'm putting you on the spot. I apologize. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it depends. So like you've got, I like the, where you start talking about the atmosphere. So that's kind of like the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's like, a, it's like you had to write about the food. Um, but so one of the things that I study is uh, the splendid table, mm -hmm. but in particular when Lynn Rosetto Casper was the host. Mm -hmm. So yeah. pre pre 2018. And so when you're talking about things like this, so you say the brie melted like butter. So that's a really good way to describe what you're eating, mm. because if you can give a simile, any kind of analogy or a metaphor about the food, other people who have never eaten brie now have something to understand what that's like. Mm. And so you're, you know, you say like the cloves were like spread and chutney left a sweet aftertaste. So you're giving these cues that are really subtle, but it gives your reader in this case a way to understand what the dish was like mm -hmm. um, and what they can expect to experience, mm -hmm. you know, and then, you know, you <laughs> kind of say why you might not have liked the second one, the second yeah. appetizer as much. <laughs> yeah. No, thanks. Thanks for doing that on the spot. Yeah, it's uh, it was it was tricky. I was just like thinking about myself, like I just thinking about that past, like Rich doing that and just flailing, like uh, kind of okay. I'm gonna look at the the thing, but how do I go beyond just giving the, the ingredients? It was it was uh, 
I mean, I, I look back on that time fondly. I got to go to a lot of like restaurants, but I was also mainly just doing music. So it was just like this little yeah. like half and half thing, which is very atmospheric, but like, um, yeah, just about the, the overall like narrative experience was, was fun to do. Yeah. And I think part of reviews or writing about food is teaching people about that item in particular, mm -hmm. especially if they've never eaten it. Yeah. So it's like, we can give them a list of ingredients, but are they going to know what that ingredient is? Mm -hmm. So if we can compare it to something else, it's going to help people and help our readers, you know, thinking about our audience and, mm -hmm. and what they might know. Mm -hmm. uh, who's a food writer you admire? I really like Samin Nasrat. Mm -hmm. Have you seen or read any of her stuff? Okay. No, no. What's, yeah, what's a, 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 a text? Yeah. Several years ago, this is how I got into her. I can't even remember the year. It feels, it was pre-pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Netflix came out with the series Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat. Okay. Gotcha, gotcha. And it was, so that was the name of her book. And mm -hmm. when you watch it, it's only four episodes. But she talks about the importance of those four things. So you have to have salt because it's a flavor enhancer. You have to have acid because if something is too sweet, it just doesn't pop. Mm -hmm. You have to like heat things because that changes the chemistry of it and will enhance the flavor. The flavor. Um, and the fat also helps bind everything together. Mm. And so each episode of the show kind of takes you through that. But then the book is this masterclass on how you can use what you have and make it make sense for the cuisine you're making. So if you're trying to make, hmm. you know, an Italian dish for the fat, you're not going to use sesame oil. You're going to use olive oil because that's what would be in those dishes. Mm -hmm. And so there, the book has like color wheels and you can pair things together. Uh, so the TV show, her book, but then also she used to write for the New York times. She had a food column. No, sorry. Right. Okay. And her food column really incorporated the location senses and then the, the politics and history component of it. Mm. So she would tell these amazing stories about people or about food. And it always talked about where they came from and the importance of this dish. And so she just embodies all the things that I look for <laughs> yeah. in food writing. Absolutely. And I, I just, I love that she's distilling that too those four components, but there's so many, so much depth to each of those. Mm -hmm. It seems like, and, um, I've seen this show advertised like, and sort of like, you might like this. So I, I do need to check that out. It's a, it's a good reminder. Um, because, uh, the trailer I had watched seemed very fun, but also, you know, and sort of, uh, ethnographic and in, in some ways and, mm -hmm. but also, uh, went, went really deep. My, I, I will say like my, uh, dissertation writing kind of therapy uh and job market therapy was um watching Anthony, pretty much anything by anthony bourdain but i know it was like a, a limited view um i, I pre have appreciated his writing mainly just about like the life of a, of a cook but um just having images wonderful images of like and landscapes of people dining and, and food it was it was it was really good for me just to have like in my ear in the background so i'm sure i'd appreciate this one um, yeah. 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 So I think if, if I have this right, just remind me, um, let's just transition for a moment. When I first met you, you were wearing a shirt. I think that it, if I have it right, it displayed an anti-racist cake. Do it did. Correctly. <laughs> okay. I mean, so there's like so much innovation with this stuff. Like we can watch these shows, we can listen to sort of podcasts, but like the fact that it was on like a shirt, super interesting. Like it, it was at computers and writing. Um, a conference that happened last summer in 2020. But uh, what does that cake entail? So the cake image itself uh, is from Bakers Against Racism. Okay. And it's one of the graphics that they created to launch a digital bake sale mm -hmm. to fund and support Black lives after the murder of George Floyd. Mm -hmm. So uh, Bakers Against Racism, they sold these shirts there were a couple of different ones and the anti-racist cake, uh, the recipe that's on the cake, it calls for like, uh, 
I don't know, like half a cup of saying that you're, or half a cup of like not saying that you're not a racist um, mm. and says things like two tablespoons of identify racial inequities and discrepancies. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's an image of the cake, but the recipe itself is, you know, how to be an anti-racist person. Mm -hmm. And these kinds of recipes actually have a pretty long history of, of being published. So uh, in community cookbooks and other spaces mm -hmm. where uh, women are, are doing activist work, mm -hmm. They'll often put in recipes like this for activism mm. um, to raise awareness because historically cookbooks were an acceptable way for women to engage in the public sphere. So uh, Lisa Mastrangelo has an article about that, about um, women and the right to vote. And then Abby Dubasar also studies activist cookbooks. And so we see these kinds of recipes that are teaching people uh, a different kind of literacy rather than just, you know, how to make a cake. Hmm. Yeah. I, and I remember doing a piece for, or editing a piece for a special issue on comics and technical communication quarterly. And it was, they were focusing on the two authors were focusing on the anarchist cookbook and it just kind of that using that genre of recipe writing and so forth uh, collected into a, some kind of cookbook was, it was really interesting. Um, they sort of got access to a ton of different documents and so forth and, and uh, did a rhetorical reading of the entire thing. So it was, it was really neat. I'll have to link it in the description here. Um, let's, I want to ask you more about Bakers Against Racism. Uh, and then, cause I know, I think that's, if I was looking, reading that correctly, that's something a group you've also researched and, and so forth. Um, seems like a, a fantastic group. I love the idea of like, this is a cake, but it's also, you know, acknowledgements and, and statements. Um, and then you were mentioning other sort of cookbooks. I think I wanted to ask you though, like given what we've seen about bakers against racism, like in what ways is baking a rhetorical act? Is it, you know, I, I yeah. Thoughts. Yeah. I will, you know, that's the whole, the whole shtick, right? The whole right. thing I'm doing, uh, <laughs> So, I mean, baking in and of itself engages the public sphere. Mm -hmm. So bake sales have been around for, mm -hmm. I can't track down how long. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's one of the things I've been trying to find is like, when did the first bake sale happen? Um, but it was always a way for women to fundraise and, mm -hmm. and get out there. And so it's just kind of like using whatever available means you have and baking is that way to raise money for something. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, bake sales have that history. Um, but what I'm seeing in Bakers Against Racism is what I'm referring to as edible reflexive messages. Mm -hmm. And so uh, these are cakes or cookies or what have you with the anti-racist messages written in frosting or powdered sugar or something like that. Mm -hmm. So not only are you buying a delicious cake you know and it's baked very well and it looks amazing but it also says black lives matter on it mm -hmm. so there is there's no misconception to what you're supporting when you buy these baked goods and so that has been something that you know i've been seeing a lot more since bakers against racism and i did that for my own uh, BAR bake sale as well. Mm. I, I wrote some messages for abortion rights on cookies. Mm. Yeah. And did you, um, where did you just like, uh, where did you have that sale? I was in Oklahoma still. Okay. So it was, you know, Roe v. Wade was overturned and mm. Bakers Against Racism. Uh, they've been going since the first bake sale. There's been continuous bake sales to support other initiatives. And so for the month of August um, last summer, we were activating to raise money to support abortion rights. Mm -hmm. And uh, Oklahoma is one of those states where you it's very, very difficult to, mm -hmm. you know, have bodily autonomy. Mm -hmm. And so I uh, sold some baked goods with a couple of folks in Oklahoma City. 
Wow. Okay. And yeah, what a, what a powerful thing to do, you know? So, um, thanks to you for and everybody who is doing that. That's, that's amazing. I, I, I like the idea of, um, as you were talking about it, that these stances are yes in the, the, the ingredients, but they're also like front facing. And mm -hmm. I've even, I'm even remembering like when, um, uh, students in the professional writing student association here were doing like a brief bake sale but like tethering messages in with it like inspirational like writing quotes and so it's th these different ways of like passing writing around either on the surface of the thing like the edible thing edible writing mm -hmm. you know that you're sort of working with but um also sort of paratext and passages that's something we've talked about in uh, uh beer and writing courses i've taught in the past and i'm looking forward to teaching more of that yeah it's it's so that the, the actual edible thing itself is is something that's persuasive but you know what draws us to it might be images and things of that sort well, fantastic um, so okay uh we talked about something you baked for that bake sale but i want to know like what's the last thing you baked uh yesterday okay I made brownies on a whim. Awesome. Yeah, it was it was uh, the general election here in the states, and yeah. so the university we actually had off. We were closed for the general election as mm -hmm. a campus, and so I voted, and then I was like, I need to bake something. Mm -hmm. So I went home and whipped up a batch of brownies. Excellent. It, okay, so is that like a way for you to to um, I guess kind of relax, like as a as a, a hobby, so on and so forth? Yeah, I mean. That's how baking kind of started for me. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, I, I've just always loved baking. Mm -hmm. And then and when I started my PhD program, uh, I was not super keen on what I thought I was going to study. And so one of my instructors was like, well, what do you like? And I was like, oh, I like food. <laughs> and so baking, you know, turned into what I could also research. But yeah, um, and it's a big part of my research process as well. So you know, when I was working on my dissertation and studying cookbooks and cooking communities, I would bake recipes from the cookbooks or the cooking community to kind of have that connection to the group. But also I had to feed myself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it was a way to kind of, you know, step away from the computer for a little bit and make something that you could actually see the progress of mm -hmm. immediately. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, a dissertation you're working on it for a long time and the pages add up, but it's really hard to see that you've made progress. Absolutely. Something tangible, like a, a, a result. It's so amorphous. Yep. And I'm just going to warn you. That's what the book process is like. I'm not sure how oh, far yeah. along you are, but it is, uh, it is one of the things you're like, I'm just ready to take this thing out of the oven. I am just yeah. ready. I'm, I'm just still very, time. very early stages in the book process, but yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, so whether you're baking or, or doing some kind of cooking, there are a million websites out there, right? Like uh, we can find recipes on uh, BAR. We can find them on many different sites. I have right here up on my screen now, like Epicurious, which has been my go-to for many, many years. Um, and there's a ton of writing to, to sift through. Like sometimes it's not always the best. You make like a terrible, you follow a recipe like closely and it's a terrible thing. And I don't know if it's, it could either be the recipe or it could be a mix of both. Like it's likely me usually when I make the mistake because I skip things too. Um, that being said though, I was just wondering like what kind of sites or texts like do you recommend in terms of um, recipe ideas and like credibility and, and so on and so forth. Um, so there are many that you, you have, you've consulted I'm just, uh, I'm pretty narrow with what I'm looking at. So I wanted to ask you. Yeah, it's one of those things where I think people find their source and then they stick to that, right? You know, like right. Epicurious has been around for forever and it's, a, they've got a, it's a great resource for recipes. Um, I use Budget Bites a lot. Oh, okay. That's and cool. it's, Bites is B-Y-T-E-S. Okay. And I mean, it started because, you know, I was a broke grad student. Mm-hmm. Um, but the recipes, there's, you know, like meal prep. It's great for people who like need to plan out their meals, whether they're going to school or work or, you know, just planning for the week. 
uh, and it has like a whole variety of different diets. So it's really easy to find things that are like on the cheap mm -hmm. for whatever you want to eat. Um, but then my go-to because of all of the dietary restrictions I have is mm -hmm. Connoisseurus veg. Connoisseurus. <laughs> I cannot spell that one. Okay. Okay. I'll try it. Is it. What's the first letter? C. C. Okay. It's, it's like, you know, like connoisseur, like the French word. Oh, okay. Okay. But like, okay mashed together with a dinosaur like connoisseurus okay, uh, okay. her her yeah. logo is a little dinosaur i found it uh okay. <laughs> yeah but that one is just like hands down vegan recipes like if i am looking for something different and i want to try it out um i will turn there mm. so that's kind of like the go-to right now yeah that budget bites looks fantastic too. I mean, it just shows you like it, tells, it breaks down the price and so on and so forth. Um, and then this one's just it's very like there's like personal sort of narration to each part of it. Lots of like photos and so forth. I think like I get a kick out of when these sites have like they'll show you the result, but they like, maybe parts of it like in in the raw. You know, like when you're sort of mixing it. I have clear instructions. So it's very like a tech com thing. I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. what about how long should I do it? Cook it for? What are my options if I like vary from it a little bit? What can I add? But um, yeah, I've not heard of either one of these. So like, I wish I had that when I was a grad student, the first one, especially. Yeah, it just, it was super helpful. And, you know, a lot of my students, they'll write recipes for my, my tech com classes. And so mm -hmm. we'll look at a couple of different recipe websites for examples. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. Okay. You talked about this a little earlier, but I'll just put it to you um, just as a kind of, uh, as we're starting reaching the end of our conversation. Um, you know, if it's, whether it's like recipes or um, tasting in class, things like that, like what do you think is a good way to introduce food rhetorics and writing ideas to to students? Yeah, I think getting them to emphasize that kind of, embodiment mm -hmm. is is kind of you know where i start um and thinking about localizing it for wherever you are mm -hmm. so even if it's you know like day one um i did this the second week of class with my grad students i asked them okay like what food defines illinois western mm -hmm. illinois or western illinois university and so and, and then, you know, I just, we made a list hmm. and that way we're, we're thinking about, you know, where we all are currently hmm. and we didn't all come from Western Illinois. Um, right. you know, some of my students did, but you know, I am not from Illinois at all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, uh, so we, we just did that and, you know, they came up with some great examples of, of things that I didn't think they were going to say, uh, what I thought they were going to say, they did not say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so it's just getting them to think about like the foods that are local to wherever you are in that moment. And then, you know, they can always write about foods that they know, but you could turn it into kind of this local experience. And Stephen Alvarez does that a lot with his mm. work. Uh, he has a whole class called Taco Literacy. And Fantastic. they, yeah, it's, <laughs> that's really you know, he was the first one that I saw doing work that really inspired me uh, in relation to food and rhetoric and literacy and really just exploring the local food uh, and thinking about what you have wherever you are. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of, you know, how we get started. If if I'm like, all right, we're going to talk about food this semester. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I, th I think it's... I'm, I'm imagining like that this class would be really interesting even outside of the classroom walls itself, like class at a sort of restaurant or some kind of like group dinner, you know, and that's, I imagine like it's probably still like a little challenging with the pandemic, but yeah, yeah I mean, but still like, um, we could only, we I only think, hope one day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Next time. So the other thing about Western is that we've got uh, two campuses and Another. one is about an hour and a half away. So I've got some grad students who zoom in. Oh, um, yeah. So we've been hybrid since before the pandemic. 
Mm. And so I didn't do it this semester and I wish I had, I could, I just like brought my laptop with me, but we read uh craft rhetoric, like the social rhetoric of beer. Mm, okay. And we, I was like, we should have had class at the brewery, yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, maybe, maybe next time around. Right. And yeah. I'll just bring my computer and whoever needs to zoom in can, you know, <laughs> be there yeah. virtually. Why not? You know, that, that's, uh, it's interesting. And I think, I think speaking of that, like, um, next week we'll be talking about drinks and so forth on, um, on the stream here. And I'm fascinated that sometimes, uh, food is what sort of separates what you think of as like a brewery or a brew pub and, you know, an actual or a restaurant and so forth. And there's a, a lot of like sort of laws. I really can't uh, articulate at the moment that um, places have to sort of buy by, they have to serve something. Right. And I've seen even some of that, like, I think it was in Indiana. There was a place that said they sold food because they had to, but it said $25 hot pocket like sandwiches. Like, so if you want to pay 25 bucks, you can, we technically have food. But it was like this kind of um, basically just middle finger at, you know, sort of laws and say like, yep, you have to have soup for serve food at this bar. Um, Colorado, like the way that and a lot of breweries that I've seen now will get like have menus on the table. And so like a lot of the breweries in Colorado, um, which is where I was before Oklahoma, have like restaurants that will deliver to them. Mm -hmm. And that's how they got around it, which I thought was great because mm -hmm. like yeah, I'm at this brewery and I can order a pizza from down the road. Like, mm. it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, I have two more questions for you. Uh, we talked about so many interesting things here on the program, but uh, what are you working on right now? Lots of, always, always lots of things. Yeah. So, you know, officially the book manuscript, no longer dissertation. Mm. So that's, that's the biggest focus. Um, and I haven't, you know, I have all the chapters, but I decided that I wanted to add a new chapter, which mm -hmm. is the Bakers Against Racism chapter. Oh. So I'm taking kind of what I started uh, with my computers and writing presentation and turning that into, uh, I think it's the, yeah, the fifth chapter of my book. Okay. And so the rest of the chapters are, just need you know some fine tuning post dissertation yeah. um but it really feel felt like i needed to have the bakers against racism chapter be the last case mm. study for my book so that's mm. the that's the bulk of the research um but the other project is with sourdough yeah, wow, yeah. <laughs> and yeah so i i call it sourdough rhetoric i use the hashtag when i post about it Mm -hmm. And basically I'm looking at how we can use, you know, baking as an embodied research experience and thinking about what that looks like at conferences in our field. So at SEAS in February, I will be presenting about sourdough where uh, people in the audience will be invited up to rehydrate sourdough starter mm -hmm. while I am giving my portion of the presentation. So do you think like, I have this, imp it's more of an impression. I'm, I'm, I have the impression that writing and explaining sort of how the food rhetoric sort of operates or like what your findings are does kind of demand like participation. It's Definitely. Because again, if you're just showing a flat screen of sourdough or like beer or anything it just doesn't quite connect as much right and it's like i'm telling you about you know how the smell of of sourdough you know brings back all of these memories or whatever it is but if you if i'm just saying that to you it falls flat but if you're in the audience and all of a sudden you start to actively smell the sourdough starter because it's pretty pungent mm -hmm. it, it's going to trigger those those moments and you're going to have a deeper connection to what I'm talking about as an embodied research practice. Hmm. I am not um, currently scheduled to go to C's, but I am, I'm smelling this from afar now. I'm, I'm excited. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> my other panelists were, I, I think we're going to be frosting some cutout cookies. 
Uh, <laughs> and then I, we're going to be writing some recipe cards together where it's a very interactive panel that we pitched. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's in Chicago, you know. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, so tempting. Um, um, yeah. Well, this has been a very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, tasty discussion. <laughs> Clearly, you are doing so many cool things uh, from the appetizer, we might say, which was the dissertation to this uh, four to five course meal, which will turn into a book. Um, it's it's very exciting. I'm excited. Yeah. <laughs> It'll yeah. get there. Yeah. Um, so with all that said, I just want to have one last question for you. What do you think I should make for dinner tonight? So what's the weather like? Um, it's just slightly, probably like in the 40s, something like that. Sunny, but at night, you know, at five, the, everything goes down and it's yeah. cold, very cold. Do you, and do you have like an hour? I have an hour. Yeah. Okay. I, can, I can make an hour for your record. Yeah. Whatever you recommend. <laughs> because I, I was like, I know, you know, work, kid, all the things. Yeah. Uh, so it's my favorite time of year right now because it's pumpkin risotto time. Pumpkin risotto. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. And so uh, I don't know. Have you ever made a risotto? I have. And I actually, it was okay when I did it. <laughs> um, but I could, I could always use some tips for making it better. Yeah. It's, I don't, you know, it seems really intimidating. It's just a bunch of stirring and you know, you take like six cups of stock mm -hmm. uh, and a cup of wine, white wine, whatever dry white wine you like, and your arborio rice. And I usually make, depending on how much I want, mm -hmm. two cups is like the smallest amount because mm. yeah. um, that'll that'll serve like four. But normally I make a, a double batch. And mm -hmm. so I'll make four cups of rice and throw in like some shallots or some onion, whatever you feel mm -hmm. like doing. Yeah. And, you know, you just put your your rice in the pot and throw your wine in and let mm -hmm. it absorb and then ladle in, you know, just a ladle full of broth. And it takes like 25, 30 minutes because mm -hmm. uh, you don't want to go too fast and you just keep stirring it. And then after it's all said and done, you just take one can of pumpkin and you stir it in and it okay. gets nice and creamy and i usually add a little bit of nutmeg uh some you know like salt and pepper that sort of stuff and then you can drizzle on a little bit of balsamic vinegar mm. right before you eat it if you want to add that kind of acid that yeah. <laughs> mm. that we've got going on yeah so that's that's like it's it's my favorite fall dish and it, you know because it's it's kind of chilly outside mm -hmm. And it's just super comforting to have a giant bowl yeah. of risotto. Yeah. And hanging out like uh, sweaters and, you know, all that sort of stuff. Uh, that's that's amazing. I'm going to. OK, that's a good reminder. Um, I have not made much with pumpkin. I did do risotto. But yeah, it was just the stirring which confused me. You know, I was like, oh, I got to keep doing this. It's so different than any sort of like um, Italian dishes I've done. But. Well, like normally you just put rice in there and then you let it go and you don't want to stir it because right. you want it to like absorb all that water. But yeah. And, it, you know, you just, I mean, I say six cups, but sometimes it's less, sometimes it's more depending on how hot your heat is and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. you just keep going until it's nice and creamy yeah. and the rice isn't crunchy anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's one of my favorite things to do because I like to stand there. And it, you know, it's after I've been sitting or teaching all day, you know, mm -hmm. gives me that, that time to just hang out, listen to some podcasts and make risotto. Exactly. Yeah. And when you're doing, you're having a conversation or you're just even just sometimes like zoning out while you're making something, it's, it can be pretty freeing, I think, and a good distraction from all the digital things that we're, we're sort of doing in our research and teaching. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, well, Ashley, thanks again for joining us. This has been fantastic. And uh, good luck with your projects. Good luck with your baking uh, and, and all that. And um, we'll have to uh, meet each other up again, meet, meet up again sometime for a meal. Yeah. Thanks again for having me. This was, uh, it was fun to talk about food for, you know, the morning. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I'm, I'm definitely going to get some lunch after this, but 
<laughs> All right. Well, um, I'll hang up this Zoom call. Yes. Yeah, sorry about the glitch a little earlier, but yes, we will uh, look forward to talking to you again. Okay. All right. Thanks. All right. Okay. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Okay. Let me just turn on my cam stuff. There we are. Hello, everybody. We're back. Okay. Um, well, what a fantastic discussion. Like I said, it's not far from lunchtime for me. Um, and just learning about various approaches to thinking about and writing about food and ways we can even circulate and um, think critically about uh, messages for social change and social justice. I think, you know, um, Ashley's comments really shed a lot of light on, on those, those approaches. So, um, that's what I love about this podcast is I learned something new from, um, specialists in the field. Every time I'm on here, I want to take a, another quick break and we'll be right back just to talk about what's coming up in the next few weeks. All right. Be right back. Okay, we are back. So what a great discussion we had a little earlier uh, with Dr. Ashley Beardsley about food rhetorics and ways of thinking about food, the power of baking for social justice, baking against bakers, baking and bakers against racism and the many dimensions of that. Um, again, really grateful for, for her, for, uh, to her for coming on. Okay, so... Um, just some takeaways. Again, this is conversation just gets me thinking about these old reviews I had written. Um, I'm thinking like along the way, you know, how can I use sort of memory and description for 
telling these stories to give my impressions of a food. I think it would be a great exercise to maybe come back to at some point. Um, if I can get back into doing this just casually, even just writing it out, writing my, my sort of feelings as I go in, you know, to the next restaurant. Um, so there's a, a place I went to at one point called Nectar. Excuse me. Thought I was going to sneeze there for a minute. Um, and I say here, we sampled two entrees, which thankfully weren't epic proportions. Just had the Foster Farm duck breast served with Asian rice noodles, black beans, and sliced sauteed veggies, such as cucumber, scallions, and asparagus. Her verdict, the duck cooked medium rare was tender and addictive, thanks to the orange gastric sauce. Feeling seasonal, I had the summer flounder, a cornmeal encrusted fish that looked like a pancake atop a bed of spring vegetable salad, pea and mint puree, and saffron AOI. A delicious pancake, mind you. I don't recall a more original fish entree I've tried. Um, so, you know, I, I go on to talk about what we, we sort of uh, drank along the way, but like, I don't know. Um, these descriptions, I'll just add, uh, is they came straight from the actual restaurant. So though I could kind of sort of pass it off as like me sort of um, having something very original to say, I remember kind of just layering those sentences together with what was on the menu. So... I know they mentioned cornmeal, but I remember at the time, like I just put that it was encrusted on it. So sometimes I'll get the ingredients and then actually write um, some kind of thick description based on that so that you understand as a reader, like what you're getting into. Uh, again, this was like the trickiest part was actually saying, you know, what the overall verdict was. And I think like description doesn't do enough of that. It, it can show that I was interested and that she was interested. But to say that, um, you know, it was tender and perhaps addictive, like thanks to that gastric sauce, like gives us a peek at the overall impression. Um, and this is my verdict. Like, and I think this kind of is where we get at, but I remember even here, I don't really say the overall impression of the food. It's just the restaurant itself, which is kind of hard to parse out those two. Are you talking about the restaurant or the food at the restaurant or both? How do you handle those two? Um, that's a question I'll never have. I don't think I'll ever have a, a uh, definitive answer to. But as I said here, because Nectar has an impressive menu and drink list, it's easy to spend 100 or more on dinner and realize the brilliance of local slash organic cooking. So I'm saying here that it's... The purpose of me saying that is to demonstrate that it's expensive and that they're doing some original cooking because it's local. Try the restaurant on a semi-special occasion or join the dinner club and meet the connoisseurs. Sunday brunch fun happens from 10 to 2 p.m. And I wish I would say, like, what happened at that brunch, right, to perhaps convince people to um, consider it. I don't know. There's a lot, a lot I could do here. And this is, again, part, from part of the menu sampler, what they have on it. The goal of writing at that time was to give people enough information to make a decision about whether they should visit it or not, and particularly to actually visit it because that would support future ads. So um, I have much more to say about that, I think, perhaps in another episode about how do you write reviews when you know that the publication may not want a totally um, negative review. It's easy to write something really like a, a really uh, negative review, I think, or a very positive review, but to kind of give one that's fair and balanced, um, I think it's, it's its own its own challenge. And I really struggle with that when I was writing these sort of things just to, to uh, you know, remain positive, but suggest maybe that things were uh, not as good. So I have much more to say about that. And it's nice to talk about it 10 years after doing it because I think enough time has passed where it's, it's not going to uh, compromise any sort of um, approach. Okay, so really interesting takeaways from Dr. Ashley Beardsley. Again, thanks to her. I want to talk a little bit about what's coming up and then we will wrap up. And as I talked about the top of the stream, we have November 16th, Riding in the Five Senses. We'll talk about drinks, which is 
another whole area of sensory rhetorics that we can think about. I have taught a class in the past on writing about beer in the Cincinnati area. This was where I came from before I moved here. So we talked about things such as writing uh, restaurant and beer reviews, writing in re relation to beer cans, how we're sort of attracted to designs as well as the descriptions in the back. Uh, and as well as those digital writing that um, breweries have sort of helped, you know, uh, have found to be very important when getting their messaging out. So we looked at social media, things of that sort. So we're going to talk about those things um, in relation to drinks. And we've been talking about some of my favorite brews, whether it is the alcohol kind or beyond. Then November 23rd, we have writing with platforms and we close November 30th with open writing workshop and hangout. Maybe these two conversations will lead to even more <laughs> things about writing in the senses for next term. But for now, I think these two really uh, capture what I mean when I'm thinking about writing in the five senses. Okay, so that's all I have for this week. I'll look forward to talking with you all next week as well and some more special guests that we have in store in the next coming weeks. Until then, good luck with all you're working on in the final month or so of classes, whether you're doing um, research or you're doing teaching in those classes. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Bye.